I want to thank you all for coming and remind you that uh, we are here next month as well. We're going to be here at, in the GSB building at Williamson's next month, and then we go back to Bala. Next month, as our guests, we have three people with us. We have Susan Cohen Dickler, Jan Dickler, and Ray Murray. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Banyan Productions, but here in Philadelphia, they have produced five, six, seven uh, network shows that are being carried on cable. So they have a, they'll have a look at the cable industry and discuss that uh, with us. We've had a lot of publicity, and I, I want to particularly thank Sam Bushman and... Um, and Ms. Bove, where is she? Linda Bove, there you go, and uh, Ed, Ed Harvey. We want to thank all three of you for helping us to promote uh, the activities going on. One of our members, um, Ed Shockey, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, of course, a great uh, disc jockey, uh, has had some problems. I spoke to him in the hospital when he was there. Uh, he, uh, he got a very bad infection and was paralyzed for a little while and had an operation and he has diabetes, and unfortunately they had to remove his left foot, uh, right foot, excuse me. And uh, he is uh, working at rehabilitation, should be back at uh, Magic, but if anyone knows him and wants to call him, I believe he's home now. And, no, he, he's a Bryn Mawr Rehab. All right, Bryn Mawr Rehab. Well, there you go. That's the latest as far as one of our, our members is concerned. We want to thank everyone who's come to our luncheon today, and uh, it, well, let's enjoy our meal and uh, we'll get to our speaker. We want to finish by about two or five after two if we possibly can. So that's why we want to make sure that everybody is uh, enjoying themselves and can get out. So uh, we, know, we hear no snoring in the crowd, okay? Uh, but uh, Mark Howard was there and covered it. Man leaped out of a building and uh, threw some furniture out in front of him. I, I think they called him a forlorn lover. I'm not trying to get the full story on that. But uh, we weren't too sure. Paul Norton thought that he was going to have to do a dance here uh, because we weren't too sure that Mark was going to show up. But he's here, and I'd like to introduce a good buddy of his who will introduce the star of our luncheon, ladies and gentlemen, from Channel 6, Paul Norton, the man who writes our newsletter. Thank you. Very much. I, uh, uh, we, uh, we had a comment at the table about the fact that uh, Larry Kane, when he spoke here, he, uh, he started his uh, uh, speech at about 1.30 and he lasted till 3 o'clock. <laughs> and Bill, when he came up to make his introductory remarks uh, to, the, uh, to all of you, he said, we expect to be out of here by 2 or 2.05. As far as I know, they're still negotiating about whether or not Mark gets equal time. And Mark has a hell of a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but did Mark, when I walked in today, uh, Bill came up to me and he said, I saw Mark Howard this morning uh, reporting live from uh, the hotel downtown where that poor guy jumped out the window. And, and uh, here's Mark in the hood reporting and he said, I hope he gets here. And I said, Mark always gets here. He's always on time. And so we'll get him on on time today. Mark out. Never figured out why all you guys wear neckties to these lunches. <laughs> it's casual. There you go. It's casual. The, uh, I felt bad this morning. I live across the street from Hopkinson House where that man flipped out, threw things out the window, and then left the ledge. And by the way, is some question. I don't think he committed suicide. I think he was trying to escape from the police, and he, uh, he fell. But in any case, uh, when I saw that he jumped, I figured, well, I'll make it now because the story is over. <laughs> Sad, cynical way to look at it. Captain, I didn't see you. Captain and Mrs. Noah are here. I haven't seen you at the last few meetings. We never come, but we have an outstanding speaker. Hey, 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 hey. Now, Paul's joking about Larry Kane. The reason he talked so long, he was he was promoting his new book at the time. Right. And so he was, you know, can't blame that. But it's interesting because I'm only here because of Larry Kane twice. I came to Philadelphia in 1977. Uh, when I got a call from Bob Feldman, who was then assistant news director at Channel 6, and he said, um, Larry Kane is leaving. Jim Gardner is going to replace Larry Kane. 
we'd like you to come to Philly and replace Jim Gardner at what was then the 5.30 News. So because Larry left Philly, went to New York, that is the direct cause of my coming to Philadelphia. And then he was at KYW, and when Viacom took over, they started reassessing their world and decided that, you know, Larry was on the verge of retiring anyway, so he decided to leave Channel 3, and they said, gee, we'd like you to come over and do the 11 o'clock news. So, so twice, in the last two moves in my career have been the direct result of Larry Kane, and I thank him for that. That's, I mean, don't go for the third. so far. Don't go for the third one. <laughs> God forbid. Um, I'll tell you a couple of things about what I did. First off, a lot of people who are my age or older, I'm 65, have said that they're really thrilled to see somebody get a new job at 65. <laughs> I'd like to be a poster boy for art. You know? And I will tell you, and I'm sure many of you who still work and do things will agree that a new job is, you know, it's like when you see a 65-year-old guy, they have a baby, and it, it invigorates me, says it's like, you know, you're young again. Well, it's true, you start a new job, and you get all the juices going, and you really feel good about it, and it's a wonderful thing, and I commend it to you as a way to keep your eye on the future. Not the past. Do something new. Write a new book, right? Okay. Now, uh, that's the upside. Now, the part of the downside is, I said to one of my fellow workers at KYW the other day, I, I, I don't know if I can get used to being number three. And they said, no, well, you'll get used to it. <laughs> it is, uh, it's a little disconcerting to look at the Nielsen overnights every morning, which I get emailed from the sales department. Maybe I should tell them to stop doing that. I don't know. But it's, um, it's a little disconcerting sometimes to see that the station has a long way to go. And, and, of course, the reality is that's why they asked me to join them. They thought I could help them do it. Uh, Dennis Swanson, who runs all the TV stations for Viacom, and, and Peter Dunn runs this station, KYW, they said, we have two choices. We want to really revamp our, our news. The 11 o'clock news is the most important of the day because stations make the bulk of their profits on prime time and the 11 o'clock news. And he said, we have two choices. We can get a really good young anchor and give them five years to grow into the market and become well-known. Or we can buy somebody who's already well-known and maybe we can jumpstart the process. So they, they decided to do that. And they said if I could stay alive for five years, maybe I could help them get <laughs> So I, I continue to do that. The, um, we got off to a good start the first night. The 11 o'clock news was number one. It hadn't been number one since, but it was number one the first night. In fact, I went in the second day and I said to the boss, you know, I think I'm going to retire. <laughs> you know, I went over here, you're number one. It's not going to get any better. <laughs> I mean, even if you stayed number one, it can't get better than that. And we're not going to, that's not going to happen anyway. So. Anyway, I was, I'm very happy to be doing this, and I really do commend to you the uh, opportunity to try something new when you think you're sort of finished. I remember the most depressing birthday of my life was 60. And for some reason, I don't know why 60 stood out, but I felt nothing, nothing great ever happens to anybody after 60, unless they become president of the United States. You, you don't see in the paper that the new CEO of the company is over 60, or that the new anything is over 60. It just doesn't happen. But it can happen. And I, and I really think that, uh, that having done this, it's, uh, I'm glad I did it because I've been at uh, Channel 6 for 25 years, 25 years plus, and uh, number one all the time. I mean, it, it's interesting how KYW figured in my life there because I came here in June of 77, the end of the month, and in that same month, I believe, Mort Krim and Jessica Savage left KYW. Mm -hmm. Now, they had been number one in the May book a month before at 5.30, which was the half hour that I came to do. And they left, and I believe with them, Al Meltzer left and went to Chicago. Didn't he go to Chicago yeah. with Mort Krim? I think so. And Bill Custer, either then or right thereafter, left and went to Denver. So that station that uh, Meltzer used to call Camelot ended. And 
we became number one in the July rating book, which used to be a, a rating book of note, and uh, have been number one in every book ever since. In fact, from that moment forward, I think until two years ago when Channel 10 won the 11 o'clock ratings in one book, every major newscast on Channel 6 has been number one for 25 non-stop years. That's an awesome record. But it's because of the changes at KYW that that happened. Not to say it might not have happened eventually anyway, but when I came to town, you had three very competitive stations here. Facenda, I think, had just retired in the late 70s, no? Yeah. 72. 72, was it already? Oh, I thought it was later. Well, anyhow, he had retired. Um, it, was, uh, it was a very competitive situation. And it has not of late been competitive, and uh, part of my job is to try to make it that way. If you have any questions about all this, by the way, feel free to ask, because I just came up here to kibitz. Uh, I, I, I was impressed to see in the paper today, by the way, Sam Bushman put a, a note in there that I'd be here, and it said I was being honored by the broadcast panel. I said, Sam, why'd you say that? This is, I'm just the speaker. He said, well, if you don't say you're being honored, they won't put it in the paper. <laughs> Sam knows it. He just says he's going to speak. What a big deal. He says he's being honored. Oh, well, we have to put that in because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to slight anybody. They so, uh, lie to them. They lie to us all the time. There you go. Who? The newspapers? Oh, Joe. Have you worked at all three stations or just two? Did you work at KY? No, I didn't work at KY. Oh, not yet. <laughs> yeah, there's still time. <laughs> yeah, right. or you, you, never, you never know. You never know. Ask him if he's 60. Maybe he'll get a job. Uh, hey, Mark. By the way, good things do happen after 60. Pavarotti's 64. He's got a 33-year-old girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, <laughs> she's having twins now. Picasso had a baby at 89, so. What Babies are one thing, but I happen to be an opera fan, and the way and the way Pavarotti wound down his career is just terrible. Yeah. Just terrible. You couldn't keep up with her. No, I, I, I can't imagine that there's a connection because because I think a young wife. In fact, they used to tell stories about Ezio Pinzi when he, you know, before South Pacific, he sang at the opera. Mm -hmm. uh, the opera fans never forgave him for leaving the opera going to Broadway. But they say that he was such a Michiganer. That's French for. Crazy. Um, he was so goofy that literally women would come backstage during the intermissions in the operas two and three at a time. And then he'd go out and sing better than ever. Good huh? for him. So, so I, 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 don't, I don't see the connection. But in Pavarotti's case, that really was sad because you know he was scheduled to sing Tosca at the that Met. That was going to be his his, his last his performance. Did that. And uh, when they, they, he couldn't do it, he had the flu or something. And the manager of the Met said to him, "Why don't you go out and say something on the stage to the audience?" Because this is your last scheduled appearance here. And he, he wouldn't do it. He just didn't want to be bothered. It was a shame. He was, uh, he, he had the greatest voice. I interviewed him once and I said, how do you feel? You know, every, every 50 years or so, the Lord gives somebody a voice that is really unique. Boy, you recognize it. Not just, you know, a good voice, but I mean, you, you could hear his voice. I mean, Benjamino Gili was the, he said when he was a kid, he heard Gili sing, he wanted to sing like that. And he did. I mean, he, a beautiful voice. And I said, how do you feel about that? Every 50 years, the Lord gives somebody a great voice like this, and he said, no, 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 no. Every 10 years. <laughs> so I said, name a few others. Well, he named some nice people, but they weren't in his class. Anyhow, I digress. Um, television news, speaking of digressing, television news has really changed and become really competitive. And uh, I was talking to Wee Willie about years ago when news was like public affairs. I remember in Youngstown, Ohio, in 19, uh, maybe 62 or 3, the news director was walking down the hall with a young man, the general manager's walking the other way, and the news director says, oh, Mitch, have you met so-and-so? He's the new reporter I hired yesterday. Now, could you imagine a reporter being hired by a television station, and the general manager didn't even know who he was until after he was hired? Because in those days, the news didn't matter. You had to do it. That was the FCC law. Very few sponsors bought into it. In those days in Youngstown, I did the weather, and the weather had a sponsor, so I got a fee. 
So I made more money than the anchor man <laughs> on the news because he was just reading the news and I had a sponsor. So it, it worked out pretty well. I, uh, I, I kind of miss some of the people at Channel 6. It's a nice place. Hmm? Hope so. Oh, sure. <laughs> miss some of the nice people. Um, I don't miss some of the people. <laughs> I miss some. I don't. You know how that works. Sure. <laughs> That's Charlie Bradley retired. Pardon me? Charlie Bradley you retired. Promise. <laughs> you promised never to say that name. Okay. Well, Charlie used to come up. Yeah. For those who don't know, Charlie Bradley was the program manager for 100 years at Channel. Yes. Now, Captain and Mrs. Noah worked for Charlie. Now, they've had a few other bad breaks in life. But they've had some good breaks. They've had some good breaks, and I wouldn't be surprised that that he probably, in many ways, helped you do what you did. <laughs> Only him. No yeah. more than when I was in church work, the devil helped me. Why <laughs> not? The devil helped you a lot. Yes. Because the devil helped you just the way just the way that uh, Bull Connor helped Martin Luther King. <laughs> oh no. You need the bad guy right. to push the good guy to the front. Oh, yes. So in that sense, the yeah. devil did help you. Yeah, Are they the buying that? Is anybody yeah. buying that? <laughs> because if bad stuff doesn't happen to you, then you don't appreciate the good stuff. You know, if, if you don't get sick, you don't pray for health. I mean, you need... Yeah. Was it, was it one of the Barrymore? I think Ethel Barrymore said, it's a good thing that every now and then life brings us to our knees because that's where we learn to pray. Now, isn't that nice? Hey. I quit on account of Charlie. You quit on account of Charlie? Yeah. Oh, I thought you quit on account of Jim O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused. Ah, I knew you didn't like somebody there. Right? <laughs> Charlie Brady was the program manager for a long time. He came from Buffalo when Larry Pollock came down from Buffalo, and they took over the station. Charlie was a program guy who always wanted to be a general manager but never got his chance. And in fact, when when Dave Davis, the news director, moved up to program to general manager. That's when Charlie pulled the plug and decided he'd retire, took his Cap, his Cap City stock and went out to Palm California, Springs, California. 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 Right. And Charlie used to come up every afternoon around 3 o'clock, 3.30, and he'd sit next to me in what was Dave Roberts' chair in the newsroom until Dave would come in to get ready to do the weather around 4. And he'd sit there and he would bitch about the newsroom. Oh, geez, these guys, if you guys don't know what you're doing, why is this news director doing this? Why is he doing that? And he would just mutter and mutter and mutter, and I would listen, because I was a captive audience and also respectful of the fact that, you know, Charlie was uh, one of the few guys in the station who was older than I. So I paid him the respect that you pay to somebody who's a little older than you. Um, but, but he ran all the program stuff, and so he... Uh, his job was to abuse Wally Kennedy, uh, Carter and Pat Murbrier. Uh, who else was on that? Oh yeah, Sissy Hurst. Did you work for him actually? You produced specials, right? Like the, like the telephone. Uh, every mistake he made, he blamed on. Is that right? <laughs> but he got away with it, didn't he? Yes, he did. See? Well, that was you was right at that time. You got along with him, didn't you, Bill? He would tell you. Yeah. But see, Charlie had been a cameraman. In fact. I came to find out from him once that when I was uh, an announcer, newsman, weatherman, whatever, in Youngstown, Ohio, Charlie had his first TV job working in Youngstown, Ohio, as a cameraman. He worked at the ABC station. He was he was a he was an audio engineer also. Audio, yeah. 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 And for the perp when he first came <clears throat> to Channel Six, the two people that were responsible for remotes more than anything uh -huh. were Walt and myself. Oh yeah. And for a goodly amount of that time, when when people go to another station, they like to bring their own soldiers with sure. them and that type of thing. And it took Walt and I three years to convince him that we weren't stealing from the company. Yeah, and after that, we could have yeah, stolen yeah. anything we wanted. Uh, <laughs> you became you became part yeah. of the team. Well, yeah. well he, he, he was a tough let's guy. Let's get off Charlie. Bro. Yeah. 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 All right. Enough Let, of that. Let's get yeah. on the big event. How did you, uh, your contract was winding down at, yes. at six, Yes. and how did you uh, put your little messages yes. out, number one, number two, and what did Jim Gardner say to you? Uh, Jim and I talked about it before, when I first was meeting with the, the people from Viacom, I told Jim I was doing that, and he said, oh dear, he said, um, you know, if you, if you, if you in any way, uh, 
suggest that you may want to leave, he said, I don't think our manager is going to want to hear that, and he's not going to be very conciliatory, but you got to do what you got to do. What happened was that my contract was coming up, as they do. I was one of the few people in the city who had a, who did not have a no-compete clause in my contract, so I could, at the How end of my happen? contract. How did that happen? Well, that happened, that's another story. Uh, I came here 25 years ago, and, and then the after, after one contract, three years later, Larry Pollock was managing the station, and he said, well, he said, um, there's something I want, uh, we should do for you, what we've done for other people. You have a no-compete clause, but now you've been here for three years, so you're established in the market. He said, I could either arrange that if we decide not to keep you at some point, we would pay you something for the year that you don't compete. That would be fair, because after all, we can't ask you if we fire you or don't renew you and you don't have a job, we should do something. Or he said, I could just leave out the no-compete and you just give us the right to match any offer you get elsewhere. And I said, well, I'd rather have that because I don't like the idea that I can't come and go. And so over the years, a couple of times, I've made a discreet inquiry into what was going on in town to see if there was something I should be looking into and never saw anything worthwhile. And this year, um, they, the, the newsroom management changed a few years ago. And there were days when it was less than a wonderful place to go to work. Don't cross yourself, you little Jewish kid. Paris <laughs> <laughs> is over here making the sign of the <laughs> Anything if it works, right? <laughs> Whatever works. Um, Bob left. It, it, was, it wasn't. Some things weren't terrific. So when things are terrific, you get, you know, what do you do? I mean, who do you talk to? Well, in my case, I called Lloyd Remick, who's a lawyer who handles people who do this kind of stuff. And I said, Lloyd, let me send you a copy of my contract and see what you think, where I am and what, what I could do or might do. He read it, sent me a bill. <laughs> I said, geez, you read this for a long time. He said, oh, it was a tough read. It wasn't well written. I had to read it three times. Anyway, he said, look, if, uh, if, if uh, July comes along and you're not talking to them uh, specifically about a new deal, you're free to do what you want. And I said, well, why don't, and when that time comes, we'll talk. So the time came, we talked. I said, well, I don't want to cause any trouble, and I don't want to publicly, you know, I don't want to go public that I'm looking for a job, because I'm not really looking. I don't know. I'm here. Been here 25 years. I figured I'd die there, you know, uh, just stay there. Uh, and probably could have. I mean, I could have. I was offered a job. Anyway, he said, well, I know... Um, I know Marcellus Alexander down at Channel 3 well enough that I can have a conversation with him, sort of off the record, so nobody will know. He won't tell anybody. He said, I don't know anybody at Channel 10 well enough to do that, but I could do it at Channel 3. So he called me back and said, well, Marcellus said they'd, they'd be very interested in you going to work there. And then within a week or so comes the news that Dennis Swanson, who'd been running WNBC New York, was taking over as the uh, station's person for all the Viacom stations, CBS stations, and he was very aggressive in hiring people. In fact, he hired Joe Ahern away from ABC to go back to Chicago where he'd been to the CBS station. He stole a, man, uh, a sales guy from WNBC New York where he'd been to run WCBS New York. And he stole Peter Dunn, who was the national sales guy at WNBC to come here and run this station. So he's grabbing people all over. So. Next thing you know, we're ha I'm having lunch with him at Lloyd Remick's office. Don't do that. He orders sandwiches from a lousy guy. <laughs> go out to lunch with him. I didn't want to go out because I didn't want to be seen talking to somebody who might know who Dennis Swanson was. Anyway, we had a nice chat, had a chat with Peter Dunn. I said to my wife, you know, I suddenly have an insight into what it's like to be a young girl with big boobs. Ah. <laughs> These guys are after me. <laughs> said, this is bizarre. I mean, sexist thing to say. I apologize. But but really, they, they really wanted me to go there. So I, well, I listened. I talked to Channel 6. I talked to Channel 3. Back and forth. Long story short, at the end of the day, I really felt that I was welcome to stay at Channel 6. But they didn't care if I did or didn't. That was sort of the way I made it. They wanted me to stay. You're welcome to stay. But I didn't feel... 
I was made not to feel as if it really mattered. Now, I understand that part of that is if you make somebody feel like you really want them, then they ask you for more money. You know how that stuff works. So you want to kind of play the balancing act of, well, you know, we'd like to have you stay, but if you don't want to stay, it's okay. You know. And the other station was like, oh boy, we'd like you to do this. So I caved in and went there. And uh, Did you expect this to be the sort of media bombshell that it was? Yeah. I guess only because... Only be, yeah, only because for KYW to get somebody from Channel 6, that's unusual. The same thing happened, you know, six years ago. They got Dave Franklin. They got him away, and of course, Dave was on in the morning doing the weather, so in terms of notoriety, I was probably more notorious than he, so therefore I assumed it would get some impact. I was disappointed the way the story got out. It turned out that somehow the story got leaked, and Larry Kane was unhappy that they were out shopping for his successor without telling him and so he let the story get out and so it it was not it didn't work out as well as it could have in terms of but that stuff never does there's the kissinger rule you know henry kissinger said once if there's bad news you get it out don't wait for somebody else to get it out because it's gonna you have bad news get it out yourself and be done with it but in any case it went the way it went. Uh, and, then, and then Marcellus left. Oh, yeah. wait, there's a worse chapter to that. <laughs> Talk about embarrassing moments. So I have lunch the first time with, with Dennis Swanson, Marcellus Alexander, and Lloyd Reynolds. We eat the bad sandwich and we're talking with this, with that. And Dennis sounds like he really wants me to go work there. And of course, he runs the stations. And he said, we get up, shake hands. He said, by the way, I must tell you, and this is very much off the record, but if you come to work for us, you will not be working for Marcellus Alexander. He knows this, of course, but Marcellus is going to move on to another job at the company. And as we speak, in New York today is the young man who will be running Channel 3, meeting with the next guy up the ladder, working out his deal to come run the station. So if we're going to do this, you'll be working for him, not for Marcellus. And I'm like, that's, that's nice, you know. How to make a guy feel really important. Tell him that he's, I mean, he knew he was, he knew this, but it was still awkward. <coughs> Anyhow, three days later, I met with Peter Dunn, the new manager. We go on from there. So it was, uh, it was one of, one of those kind of stories. But what, what kind of commitment have they put behind you now to the, to the show itself? The well, if, if you, if you have been watching Channel 3 over the years, and if you watched it now, they have redone all <coughs> the graphics. So the look is different. They are building a new news set, which will be on, online within a few weeks. Uh, they hired Kathy Orr from Channel 10, who does the weather, who is a pretty well-known personality in town. And of course, Channel 10 took a double hit because John Valeris left them. So they lost their two top weather people. And, and they are adding a million dollar Doppler radar thing for the weather. And they've added a couple of new reporters and people. So. Overall, I'd say they are serious about getting their newscast to move up. Now, it's an interesting business, as you all know. You don't have to move up very far to make a lot of money. They, if they make a rating point, they will, they'll pay my salary and then some. So in terms of the growth, it's well worth it to them to try to do this. And CBS Network, part of the package was this all, it's interesting how things work. Les Moonves, who runs CBS Network, the whole CBS thing, when he signed the new deal with David Letterman to keep him, because ABC wanted to steal him away, he promised that he would beef up the network programs between 9 and 11 p.m. and beef up the local newscasts on the own stations between 11 and 11.30 so that David Letterman would have a bigger lead-in and hopefully be able to do better against Jay Leno. So. The network made that commitment. So any place they can, they're trying to beef up their 11 o'clock newscast on all the owned stations. Of the top five markets, the news director at KYW is the only one who was here before BS, before Swanson. Uh, <laughs> the other four are gone. They've been replaced. How much input do you have to the product now? Well, you know, input is sort of like you have as much input as you want, uh, and it's, it's a delicate thing. I have never like to tell a producer what to do. I ask, I suggest. 
If I really get annoyed about something, I call the general manager and let him suggest. <laughs> but the bottom line is we're all in the same boat. We all want to win. So it's a question of what's the best way to do it. And of course, there is no, it's not black and white. There never is a hard answer on what will work. I mean, I think based on Channel 6's success and other things I've seen, that you win audience by doing a good broadcast day in and day out for years. And then slowly people develop a habit. You become part of the habit. And slowly but surely you make inroads. Yeah. Are you getting your own Sunday show? Oh, th th I wanted to do that. I still do want to do it. The problem is that the two time periods, which are 10.30 to 11 and 11 to 11.30, are taken. I can't understand why Bob Schieffer doesn't want to move face the nation. <laughs> In fact, I said, that, you know, I said, for the last five years that I've been looking at the ratings, Inside Story was on for 15 years over there. And the last several years that Meet the Press is on 10.30, Face the Nation, Inside Story. Every rating book, Inside Story, beats them. Once in a while, it'll tie Meet the Press, but it always beats Face the Nation. So I don't know why they wouldn't move Face the Nation to 11, you know, but they don't want to do that. One of the drawbacks to television today is that the stations, the big stations, are owned by networks and corporate structures that don't have a personal opinion, that don't have an ownership that can say, you know what, that's good, let's do it. Because they got to, what's it worth, what's it going to cost us, you know, all those things that have nothing to do with anything. So, so you're stuck with doing what you do. It's, there was a time in the old days, did you, did you work for the uh, ambassador? Were you, sure. were you at Channel 6 before? Just, oh, that's the success of my retirement. When did you yeah. start? <laughs> Every time he gave six million dollars to somebody, said, there goes yeah. my money. When did, uh, when did you start there? 67. Oh, well then you know. Well, sure. In other words, if you, in 1967, if Carter went to Ambassador Annenberg personally and said, you know what, we're doing a children's program, and it really would be a better program if we could spend $100,000 a year on something of that year. If, if he liked the idea, he'd say, go ahead, do it. It was his money. It was his station. If you went today to a manager and said, i got a great idea, we'll spend 100 he looks there and says, EBITDA, whatever that is. Oh, bottom line. Oh, you know, lawyers. All this stuff that has nothing to do with the issue, but it's what runs these big companies today. So corporate ownership of broadcasting has really put a, a dent on the one hand. On the other hand, corporations generate a lot of money, so it pays better than it used to pay for now. But I think those days are gone, too. With the audiences breaking up and getting smaller and smaller, and cable. with cable, we're being eaten by an army of ants. The cable's, you know, a tenth of a point here, an eighth of a point there, a half a point there. Next thing you know, other which is all that cable stuff. Other is the number one column on the ratings every day, all day. <coughs> Other wins. Because no one station is big, but they add up and they take away ratings. So as the audiences tend to shrink, and the profitability shrinks with it, I imagine, I don't think Jim Gardner's replacement will ever earn the money he earned. And I think at Channel 6, the person who replaces me will probably not earn as much money as I did, etc. Because I think we've peaked. And this is the last hurrah. And I don't envy young people, by the way, starting out in this business, because I think the jobs are getting tinier. What's your timetable uh, at Channel 3? I have a five-year contract. I know, but what do they think? What, what, when do they want to see something happen? Yes, I mean, yes, tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, they have said a couple of years. They've said a couple of years. Okay. You look at everything every day, and you see, you know, and I, I shouldn't look at overnights, because it, it's depressing. But, you know, you look the other way. Yeah. I want to ask about a couple of trends, and we've seen this happen. Uh, the breaking news syndrome. Oh, yes. No story, or the story happens four, four hours before. The other trend is sending local people to a hurricane in South Carolina, putting them in harm's way. I don't understand that. Well, the harm's way part, I think, is, is de minimis. I don't think it's really dangerous. Uh, I've, I've been in a hurricane. It's really, you know, you can be careful. But why do we need to? 
Ah, we don't need. But the problem is, and this is what happens in the television. One station does something, and that becomes normal. The others have to do it. For instance, all three television stations in Philadelphia got helicopters within a month, I think. Nobody had one. It was like a quiet conspiracy. They never talked about it, but there are no helicopters in Philadelphia. All of a sudden, we, Channel 6, got word that a helicopter company is talking to Channel 10 and 3, and so they went out and got a helicopter. Now everybody has a helicopter. Now, everybody gets these satellite trucks. I think right now, KYW is the only one in town that has a satellite truck. 6 and 10 don't have it yet, but they rent them all the time. But that's the next thing. And so, if one station sends their reporter to the hurricane, you have to send a reporter because they have a local presence. You know Dan Quayar. Mm -hmm. You know Robin McIntosh. So you send back people you know in the hope that the audience will relate to it. The breaking news thing, and that's, that's a bad one. It's been researched and studied, and that, by the way, for better or worse, the researchers figure out what people watch. They tell the stations what people watch. And they're right. I mean, they, they, you know, I mean, the truth is, that story today, we'll see tomorrow's ratings, but that story today was on for an hour and a half on three channels with this lunatic throwing stuff out of Hopkinson House. I'm sure by the time noon rolled around, a lot of people were watching that on TV. Now, I don't know why. I'm not going to judge people who sit and watch television to see a lunatic who's about to kill himself, but people do that. People gather around a person who has a heart attack on the street and watch. They stop everything to see a fire. So people like that kind of stuff. Now it turns out that if you say, we have breaking news, it gets people's attention. It got so bad, though, I was, I'm told, this is secondhand, so don't quote me, and I, I wouldn't try to prove it. But somebody told me that between, uh, between 4 and 5 o'clock, when Steve Schwade was the news director at Channel 10, they had to do breaking news three times. So, so they would have a story that was 3.30, because we knew at Channel 6 we had the story, it happened at 3.30. At 4.20 they'd come out and say, breaking news, just in. You know, big bad car accident somewhere. It happened at 3.30 and we all knew it. It wasn't breaking, it wasn't happening now, but they were under the gun to report breaking news, because that's what people, what the research indicated people respond to. Live is another thing. How often you see a reporter 11 o'clock at night live in front of a building where four hours ago there was a big exciting something. Yeah. Why are you standing there to tell me it happened four hours? Why don't you go home? Tell me from the studio. When you say I'm live, people respond to that. They think it's important. They think they're getting a better presentation. Like it or not. I mean, research proves that people don't tell you what they really want. My favorite example is Donald McGannon's great survey in Pittsburgh. Donald McGannon ran Westinghouse. He was the honcho of all the Westinghouse yeah. stations. In the glory days when Westinghouse was without a doubt the best broadcast company in America. They ran everything they did was first class. <coughs> KYW, KDKA, WBZ Boston, Baltimore, and where else? They had, where was the fifth Westinghouse. Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Anyway, they were very good stations, and Donald McGannon ran the company. And when, when John Kennedy's FCC chairman called television a vast wasteland, Minnow. Newton Minow. Minow, right. Good catch. Newton Minow said television's a vast wasteland. Donald McGannon commissioned a survey in Pittsburgh, where KDKA was big, number one. 20 questions. Question one, would you like to occasionally see an opera on television? 80% yes. Would you like to be able to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and learn a foreign language on TV? 90% yes. 19 questions about quality programming. Would you like to see programming about nature and the problem, what we're doing to our atmosphere and, the, and what we're doing to our environment? 90% said yes. The 20th question was, how, when's the last time you watched W, I think it was called the, the education station in Pittsburgh, Channel 13. QED. 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 Very good. When's the last time you watched WQED? It was W. On which all of these other things exist. 2% had watched it within the last month. So we all say, everybody says we don't want violence on TV, but they watch it. Everybody says they don't want, you know, blood. Wrestling. Cuts. Wrestling, right. Yeah, but they watch it. So, bye-bye. Mark, yes. do, you, do you see in the future any of our stations or any on-air 
stations other than cable going into a 24-hour news like CNN or at, uh, MSNBC? Or I, I don't think that the profitability <coughs> is great enough for an over-the-air license to do it. Uh, first of all, I don't think an over-the-air license would go independent totally unless they had to, because there are now there are five or six networks already. So they want the over-the-air thing. Although, last number I saw, 83 or 4 percent of the people in the Delaware Valley have cable. 83, 84 percent. So that's getting pretty high, where you can almost start throwing the sticks away. You know, you know, the transmitter becomes less and less valuable. For the short run, I don't think it'll happen. But I could imagine one day, you where you would take KYW radio, and dress it up a little bit, get some B-roll, and uh, well, they do that now. Put it on they, TV. Yeah. Five o'clock in the morning. They, they do have, that on UPN. Her, her, right on yeah. 57. Right. That's, 57. Yeah. Channel Three owns Channel 57. Right. They do some of that. They use Channel Three people, etc. Right. There's another thing. That, that, uh, another thing that, bothers you. Another thing. Right. Now, the weather wars. But yes. The day, the yeah. day the Philly sign, Jim told me the big story on Channel Six was the weather. Wow. Well, that's that's a judgment call. <laughs> That, you know, look, I called in yesterday morning to Channel 3 and I said, I just left the hospital. I visited Leonard Toes. Leonard is very ill. Maybe we should do a little something on the fact that he's in the hospital. They never got around to it because the people who are there, many of them, they don't know who he is. They don't remember. Now, maybe they're right. You see, the, the biggest, the toughest thing about television is the following. Last night at 5 o'clock, Channel 6 was gangbusters number one with a 12 rating. What's a 12 rating mean? It means that 88% of the households in the Delaware Valley were not watching Channel 6. Only 12%, but that's huge. So when you're dealing in small numbers like that, it's very difficult to figure what's going to work, what won't work. For example, Monday Night Television brings, Monday Night Football brings a lot of people to Channel 6 to watch football. But at 11 o'clock, some people want news, they can't go to Channel 6. So they go to yeah. 3 or 10. So, but the people who want, there's enough money in the people who want the football. So you do what, what works. And you can never be sure. Anytime, you know, when you cut into a soap opera, I mean, the day Frank Rizzo died, Channel 6, we went live. You know, you can sit and talk about Frank Rizzo for all day. And we did for a couple of hours. And it was interesting stuff, people calling in. For example, I found out live on television the day Frank Rizzo died in July of 1991 that he was diabetic since he was a young man. Nobody knew that. Three people knew that. That was a big secret. He got thrown, he left the U.S. Navy because he was diabetic. He lied to become a policeman about his diabetes because you couldn't be a cop and have diabetes. He was taking insulin two, three times a day and dropped dead of a diabetic heart attack just like Whitey Ashburn. That's right. Except yeah, in Whitey's saying. case, it wasn't a secret. <clears throat> and in Frank's case, it was a big secret. Hmm. So, but anyhow, it's a very interesting thing. But you know what? Ten minutes after we started covering the death of Frank Rizzo, the phone started. Where's my soap opera? I want my soap opera. So, now, which is better? To stay with the soap opera? How many people watch that? How many people don't watch? You're always making that call, and you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. And the, the greatest thing in the, in the world is the on-off switch. The channel changer. You don't like it, watch something else. I always tell people when they complain about TV news, I want, I wish, Everybody in Philadelphia would start watching Jim Lehrer at 6 o'clock every night on Channel 12. Now, my selfish reason for that is that if Jim Lehrer became number one, we all would start doing what he does, which I love to do, which is to tell you the news and then interview people about the news, and we'd all do it, and we'd do it better than he does, and that would become the new standard. But you don't watch him. Everybody will say, best newscast in the country, Jim Lehrer. Les Crystal from Channel 6 is the producer. Is that right? Formerly of Channel 6. Well, yeah, Les Crystal. Awesome. Awesome. But, if you, but you watch that show. I mean, if you, national news. They come on and give you five minutes what's going on in the country. Then they have experts come in and talk about it. Yes. You hear the real senator complaining about it. Now, it's a wonderful program. It doesn't get a one. It gets a point seven many days. Oh, I don't think people think deep enough for that more. Well, that's but that's what we see. We run a McDonald's. <laughs> Television is a big McDonald's. Regular people tune in the TV. They go to McDonald's again. Well, if you like Lebec fan, you don't go to McDonald's. 
but that you're in the minority. It's a big waste. And there's no, there's no, you can't make a living on the Lebec fan crowd in our business. If public television had to pay its own way, forget it. They couldn't sell it because they only a charity gives to them, and they deduct it, and they get some. They get some nice, you know, PR. Mark, this is like digressing, but what's your opinion of the governor of Illinois? Oh, I think I think what he did is stir up a wonderful debate, and that's good and that's important. The governor of Illinois just he pardoned everybody who was pardoned. Ryan, yeah, he he pardoned everybody on death row. They'll get life in prison instead of death. Um, legally, what he did is probably is debatable because the legislature of Illinois thinks that people who commit those crimes should be put to death. And in fact, they had hearings out there. And when some of these cases were brought to light, what these people did, it's pretty hard to argue that they shouldn't be put to death, if you, depending how you feel. <coughs> Personally, I don't like the idea of the state killing people as a personal thing, because I figure they make mistakes. They misuse it. But Eddie Rendell, when he was DA of Pennsylvania and I first of Philadelphia and I first met him twenty five years ago, right? He was running for DA right after I came here. That summer. In seventy seven. He, he, he beat Emmett in seventy seven before I got here, then he was then he ran in the fall. And uh, when I first met him I said, Explain to me how a New York Jew Democrat can be for the death penalty. Because that I had been in New York, I worked in New York, and all the liberals in New York, who are all Jewish, are all anti-death penalty. I said, how can that be? You seem like an oddball. And he leaned over and said, if you want to be in politics in the United States of America, except in New York, you have to be for the death penalty because 75% of the people favor the death penalty. Otherwise, don't run. You can't win. So that's why they're all for the death penalty. That's why in most countries of Europe, where they don't have a death penalty, it's not that they voted against it, the courts threw it out. See, the courts are protected. And one day, we're heading to the day when the U.S. Supreme Court will say that to kill somebody is cruel and unusual punishment and violates the Constitution. And then the legislatures can scream and yell, but it will be the law of the land, and it'll be done with. I did, personally don't like the idea that the state decides to kill somebody because they will make a mistake. They will make a mistake. And you could argue pretty strongly that if you have enough money and good lawyers, you will not get the death penalty. And they use an antiseptic swab before they oh, put yeah. the needle in. Oh, <laughs> damn. Great. They do, right? And if you try to kill yourself a week before, they'll put you in the hospital exactly. to get you well so they can kill you. Right. It's goofy. Mark, you find it very strange right. talking to a camera that has nobody on it. Oh, the, oh that's funny, yeah. No, that's a good question. At KYW, they have robotic cameras. They work very well. A guy named Bob sits in the back. And he runs it. <laughs> and they do work well. The one thing they can't do is they can't panic and cut real fast. They move at one speed. Don't tell Bill Russell that. <laughs> They're a little bit slow. Now, well, they did that at Channel 6? No. 35 years ago. Robotic cameras? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't pay to do it at 6, because at 6 you only use two cameras. No, but it, they, they, they had robotic They tried it. They tried. There. they tried it? Yeah. Oh, way we, back. It's 207. My time is up. I thank you all. Oh, one last question. I just want to say one thing. Welcome to the CBS family. Thank ah! The bunch of here. My father, Ed Harvey. <laughs> yeah. Bill Campbell, Joe Carrano. The whole yeah. gang is here. Uh, and at 65, we have a good health policy. Well, <laughs> I don't get your health in. Time out. I don't get your health and I get afters. There you go. But, Much better. I'm back in here. But, but I get Social Security. <laughs> I get a pension from Disney. Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and if I live long enough, I'll get an after pension too. It's a great, it's a great country. I'm glad my father and mother came here in 1920 because they could have gone someplace else. And it been God bless America. God, uh, amen. God bless amen. Oh, yeah. A lot for a good, good presentation. One quick item. Neil Harvey has sent 60 letters out to 60 colleges. We have $6,000 in $1,000 scholarships that we are going to offer to seniors in local colleges who are studying uh, communications. If any of you would like to suggest anyone, Neil Harvey is the one to talk to. We'll make those awards presentations in our April uh, meeting. Thank you.